In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We ask you to bless us, to bless our conversation, that everything that we say would be pleasing to you and uh, fruitful for everyone who hears it. We especially ask this through the intercession of Our Lady, the great Saint Joseph, and Saint Maria Goretti, whose purity was heroic. Mm -hmm. uh, this little girl who gave her life uh, to protect her honor and to prevent another from falling into serious sin and then asking that he also would be with her in heaven. Through all these great intercessors, we ask you to bless and anoint this time. We ask this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, friends. My name is Dan Burke, and I'm the uh, founder of the Abla Institute, spiritualdirection.com, all of that. Some of you know me as the former president of EWTN News, and uh, but I'm now doing the rest of uh, the other stuff full time. I'm hiding out here in Colorado Mountains, and we have a uh, Father Donald Calloway, MIC, who's a convert to Catholicism. He was a wild man out of control, and now he's a wild man for Jesus in control. And he's a member of the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception. He's the vicar provincial and vocation director, and his, his uh, community is in Steubenville, Ohio. He leads pilgrimages around the world. He's the author of 14 books. He has 72 surfboards. His latest book is the bestseller, Consecration to St. Joseph, The Wonders of Our Spiritual Father. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Welcome, Father Calloway. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's an honor and a blessing. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. I'm super, super stoked that uh, everybody's tuned in. Awesome, awesome. Well, so, Father, I'll tell you why. The second your book came out, I, I told my team, I said, we got to figure out uh, how to promote this. So a few years ago, I had, I was uh, obeying my spiritual director who basically threatened me that she was going to drop me if I didn't start exercising every day. So I started exercising every day and it actually saved my life. Obedience to my spiritual director, which of course I teach, but um, I, I was on the Red mill and I started to feel a little funny. I went to my wife. I said, Hey, feeling a little funny. I need you to watch me. And so, and then we, we ended up going to the hospital and uh, things got pretty uh, intense from there on. So I, they discovered that I had a 99% blockage in my uh, major coronary artery. And uh, so things got, intense because I was just a fraction away from death, you know, and uh, went into um, surgery. Well, it turns out that that wasn't my only issue with my heart. I had another artery that was blocked 60%. Mm. And they actually showed me on the screen, you know, because they had a, they put the dye in and then showed, showed you, you know, see how this, where your blood is flowing very large here and then it goes very small here. Yeah. Um, so they did one surgery and it was, it was fine, but they didn't, for some reason, didn't want to do the second surgery. So I had a big speaking event in Florida about two weeks after the surgery with, uh, I don't know, Teresa Tomio, um, Journey Home, my friend Marcus Grodi from Journey Home, you know, and uh, it was a full house. And I had an, so they didn't do the surgery on the second artery. I was having angina uh, uh, events, right? And then my blood pressure spiked and my, my cardiologist said, this is very grave. You need to go to the hospital right now. I said, no, I got a speaking event in Florida. I'm going to Florida. And I, I just have this sense that God, you know, you only, I mean, we all know this, right? Theologically, but practically, I'm just going to die when God wants me to die. So, so I just said, I'm going to Florida. So I go to Florida, even though I'm feeling funky, Great event, uh, a very holy, uh, oh, what is her specialty? Oncologist had set up a meeting with a priest to pray over me, and he has the gift of healing. Mm. And uh, so he prayed for me for about 20 minutes in a little adoration chapel there at Holy Cross Church in, in um, Vero Beach, uh, Florida. Mm. And when we were done, we was done praying for me. He looks at me. He's a little, v he's a little um, Vietnamese. Hopefully I got that right. Uh, priest. He looks up at me and he says, uh, 
you're going to be okay. He said, you need to thank St. Joseph. He, 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 he has answered my prayer for you. Wow. And, um, and uh, he had anointed me with oil. And you can explain this once we get going with you from the shrine in Canada. Yeah. So he'd anointed me with oil, but he said, you're going to be fine. So I go back, fly back home. And of course, I go to the hospital. They put me on a new treadmill test. They pump the dye in me and all of that. But it was a more intense test than the previous one. And uh, the doctor afterwards said, you have absolutely no blood flow issues to your heart. Wow. Right, right. And I said, uh, how is that possible? Sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, I, was, I was jesting a tad, you know. And uh, he said, I don't know, you know. I said, well, I know why that happened. You know. So ever since then, so the priest told me, do something for, for St. Joseph. Wow. You know, honor him in some way. And honestly, Father, I didn't really know how to, you know, I, I, uh, we did some posts on spiritualdirection.com, which is quite a wide reach. Yeah. And, uh, but I didn't really know. But as soon as your book came out, I thought, oh, you know, this, I can fulfill that promise to honor St. Joseph and to get the word out and to get uh, to spread devotion to him through your work. So thank oh. you so much for doing what you've done. Oh, thanks, brother. Um, I'm not surprised to hear this. I mean, uh, praise God, you know, for, for what happened there and uh, that St. Joseph helped you out. I, uh, I even heard, uh, well, it was about three, four months ago now, um, Bishop Ricken. I don't know if you're familiar with him up in Green Bay. Uh -huh. He has a great love for St. Joseph, and he goes to the oratory, you mentioned, in, in uh, Montreal every year. And he said, you know, I've always wanted to do something for, the, something for St. Joseph, but I, I haven't known what. And then the book came out, and so he said, basically, hey, I'm a bishop. I'm going to declare a year of St. Joseph in my diocese. So that's what he did. So, so people are giving thanks in various ways. So praise God. Well, and my bishop, or the bishop of our community of Apostle V.A. is Joseph Strickland. Oh, he's and, great. And he has also been a huge supporter of your book as yes, well. Yes, he has. He was tweeting about it. Somebody told me, because I'm not even on Twitter, and somebody said, hey, you know Bishop Strickland's tweeting about your book? I was like, what? I said, somebody show me their tweet thing, whatever <laughs> it is. Just, I got to see this. And I've been in touch with him since. And, uh, oh, he's he, – that, that is a bishop after my heart. I love that guy. You know, it's what's interesting about him, and it relates to St. Joseph and what you're trying to do here – are succeeding at is that Bishop uh, Strickland is a man. He, he's not a coward. He's, yep. he's strong. He's clear. Yep. He's with the church. He's not caustic, but he's, but he's very clear. And I, and I just, I, I, I told him last time I met with him, I said, Bishop, you got to understand every time you speak with that kind of clarity, it sends a shockwave of grace amount among the faithful and they just get encouraged that, oh, yes, I can be a faithful Catholic, and I'm not alone, and I have a bishop with me, yep. and uh, we also have St. Joseph with us. So I didn't plan on starting out this way, Father, but tell us about the, the canvas behind you, yep. the image on the cover of your book, show us your book again, yep. and tell us what, what, how and why you commissioned these particular perspectives on St. Joseph. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, actually a good way to, to start into it because, you know, it was probably a little over three years ago that as a priest, I've been a priest 17 years now, I have just been seeing something repeating itself in various forms, whether it's in the culture, in the secular domain, or even in the, the church, in the ecclesial domain. And it's what I would classify as two things. One would be a crisis of fatherhood where we've seen so many situations in the world where 52% of all marriages now do not, uh, or all families now, do not have a father. So more than half, a real crisis of, of, of a lack of fathers. And then even in the church, we've seen a lot of wounds in our spiritual fathers being, being put on TV and uh, sinful and criminal things. And now we've got a crisis of moral authority. People don't feel that they can trust their priests or bishops. So that's one of the things. The other, you know, that I was hearing and seeing and still am in a huge way, everybody is, you'd have to be living on another planet not to be aware of it, is the anthropological crisis today. People are confused. 
you know, um, I mean, par some parents are doing horrible things and telling their five-year-old boy that he's actually a girl and yeah. working that child's mind. And this stuff is being promoted as though it's legit and we should be, you know, allowing this stuff to happen and allowing, you know, people to read to our children in public libraries that are, you know, living really, really bad lifestyles and so much confusion. So the fatherhood crisis and this an anthropological crisis, crisis of who we are in our sexuality as men and women. So that's why, part of why, I commissioned artwork on St. Joseph to address this in a visual way. So we've got the book, right, that's going to unpack this stuff in writing and all of that. But I wanted the visualization of this too, because if you see this image here, you don't see an ogre, like you said, you, but what you see is a, a man, a real man who is masculine, strong, and I would, I would dare say chivalrous, like a knight, like a warrior, holding the Christ child and kind of, you know, in a position of like, stop, enough of this nonsense that's going on here. And that's the, the presentation that we need to, to help men to feel comfortable in their fatherhood, to be leaders, servant leaders, sacrificial men. And I think the more that we're drawn to that in society and in the church, if, if more priests start to have this kind of understanding, I think we're going to get order. When your house is in chaos and disarray and a mess, you need a good father who's strong, but loving and compassionate, but strong to clean it up. And it's a father who will be able to say to his children, uh, honey, you know, I know the world's telling you this. And maybe even one of your teachers is telling you, you can choose which way you want to go. But I, as your father, am telling you, no, no, there's right and wrong. There's light and there's darkness. There's truth and there's falsehood. We need to combat this crisis in fatherhood and anthropological crisis with the great St. Joseph. I think that it's his time now. His time has come to help us in the situation that we're in. And you're not saying this in anger. No. You're, you're, you're not saying this uh, uh, as a man who wants to dominate other people, are you? Right. No. You're, you're speaking to this uh, from a proper, as you've used the word anthropological, and maybe you could explain that. Yeah. A proper perspective or lens. God made us male and female. We are we are uh, we are we are equal in dignity and value. We're distinct in role, and He decided, didn't He, what those roles would be? But but the differences in roles doesn't denigrate either. And and you're not speaking against that. Yeah, you're, you're, you're not you're not looking to suppress anyone or to right. revive a sort of what's been called a toxic masculinity. Right. Yeah. No. Exactly. And that's where this is this will counteract that because unfortunately that oftentimes is what has happened in some of these issues so a lot of people are very um they don't they don't want a strong representation of men as masculine and therefore they call it toxic because they've been wounded by it they've been hurt by it and that that's unfortunate and that breaks the heart of god because that gift of masculinity has been used in the wrong way whether it was by priest or whether it was by a biological father or a male figure in your life. But if we want to correct it, if you want to correct it, there's a ton of other examples we could look to. But the greatest example we could look to is the greatest father of all in St. Joseph. So why go to all the replicas when you can go to the actual blueprint that's been set up for us? This man was the foster father of Jesus Christ. He was the husband of the Virgin Mary. We're talking about a holiness here that is strong, masculine, but it's servant. He was sacrificial. He laid down his life for those entrusted to his care. That's the mold that we need to see in men today to correct this wound in families and marriages and in, even in the priesthood is to, is to look to the great St. Joseph. Fascinating. You know, I had a strong father. Um, he wasn't faithful. He did convert by God's grace at the end of his life. And that was quite remarkable to, I, I actually baptized him and then wow. he, he agreed to see a priest, which he hadn't before, but uh, he was strong. He wasn't a wimp. He, I remember one time when I was a kid, a uh, classic moment, strong father, the effect it has on you. He was a masonry contractor. He was, he grew up poor, ended up doing very well, but his arm was completely bloody and blood dripping, you know, down. And I, I was just shocked as a little kid. I'm like, Dad, are you okay? And he's like, he's like, 
oh yeah, I didn't even know it was, you know, <laughs> I don't, you know. Right. Uh, and it was so helpful to me. I wonder, Father, in terms of, uh, uh, I've, I've been blessed, you know, on the other side of my, fam my family, my mom's side, love her dearly, she's still alive, but I, you know, the mother, I, I found more comfort in Mary in mm. terms of, of healing some of those m mother issues. How do you think this uh, proposal that you're bringing forward for a deeper engagement with, with St. Joseph can, can heal wounds of men uh, or even women uh, who've had weak fathers or fathers who didn't teach them what right or wrong or didn't hold them accountable in a good and holy way. Yeah. I, I think this is a, a missing link in a certain sense, because I mean, if you, if people are familiar with my story, I mean, I had three fathers before I was 10 years old. You know, my, my mother was in and out of marriages and, and none of my fathers were St. Joseph. I mean, they were not men of great virtue. Um, now the third one, my stepfather, now he's, he's a great man. I mean, he's, he's my Joseph in many ways. He adopted me. He's a tremendous man. Um, but I think there's so many wounds for people, uh, when it comes to this issue, just the other day, I was talking, uh, with, uh, Joseph Chambra. He's a man who came out of the homosexual lifestyle and he was really entrenched in it. I mean, shocking things that he was involved in, but he talks about that father wound, um, that he had and his resistance, you know, to it. But now he is a great promoter of St. Joseph because he sees in St. Joseph a father who's never going to hurt him, harm him, is always there for him, who's a protector, a defender of him. And, you know, I, I do a lot of ministry with women who are in, you know, really either horrible marriages or they've got father wounds of their own. And I can tell you that so many women, when they don't get that loving affirmation in their formative years, they end up very insecure, very insecure and longing for affirmation so that sometimes they don't pick the greatest guy to marry because that guy may just tell her what she wants to hear, but she hasn't really thought it through and then it ends up problematic down the road or, or she's just throwing herself out there wildly, which is what we have a lot today, right? The, the girl's gone wild stuff because there was such a wound with her father that he wasn't there, he wasn't affirming or God forbid, he was abusive, either emotionally, you know, sexually or something, God forbid, horrible. But that, that, that hurts a girl's heart. A girl's heart is very sensitive. And, and when that wound is inflicted by a father, you're going to, you're going to, you know, as we say with a poison, the remedy is always very close, just like with poison ivy, right? Not far from that bush is the remedy that if you put it on you, it, it heals you from, from that itch. And there's so many other examples, like, you know, the, Snake bites, for example. If you get bit by a snake, what's going to heal you? Well, the same thing. You know, what's going to make you? Well, don't run from the father wound. It Go to the father, mm -hmm. St. Joseph, mm -hmm. to find healing and comfort and the best of all fathers. That's the gift that he is for us, for all of us. You know, uh, Joseph Chambers, a, a friend, and I, I just recently did a show with him as well. And, and I... Uh, so he speaks, as you noted, about his venture into homosexuality. Now, his dad was a good man, but there were issues there. Yeah. Um, uh, God rest his soul. So for him, the the absence of a strong father led him seeking a father. Do you are you aware of a similar pattern in women to, you know, in sort of the the realm of transgender or lesbianism or things like? where people are struggling with their identity. Am I a woman? Why do I like women? You know, whatever. Sure. Is, this, is there the similar problem with women as Joseph describes with men? Do you, do you, are you aware of that? Yeah, there is. It's funny you bring that up because he was actually telling me about that very thing in our conversation the other day. And I think that he actually has some statistics on it. It's either some sociological survey or what psychologists have written about in papers that uh, yes, a lot of women who end up becoming, you know, homosexual um, or, you know, whatever those classifications are today, there's so many things, you know, that you can yeah. call things today, um, that there generally tends to be some kind of father wound there that they were either, and oftentimes, either by their father or a male figure in their life, um, abused on some, some level that made them go down this particular path. And many of them acknowledge it but some of them fight it 
But when they finally surrender to it, they realize that that is a part of it. Yeah, and I think even, you know, when you think of abuse, people think of sexual, mm -hmm. but there's also an abuse that's an absence of, you know, taking responsibility, mm -hmm. right? When you have a strong father uh, and you have a figure of a father, it also helps you with your understanding of who God is. And when you, even if, even if you have a, you know, a good provider or somebody, but, but somebody doesn't have a strong spiritual foundation, who's clear about, you know, what the world is all about, who God is, who you are, it can really make, it can blur reality for us. And it causes as, as uh, you know, common language now, the father wound or the mother wound, mm -hmm. it causes wounds in us that we seek to remedy through destructive means, right? Yes. Well, exactly. I think, you know, my story, again, that's what happened to me. And, you know, I don't blame it on my parents or anything. I made my own choices. But those were very formative years for me. And um, I wanted, you know, the, the examples that I was given when I was growing up was what I would call rabid heterosexuality. You know, I had men in my life, whether this father or father number two or my uncle or my grandfather that just were trying to score, so to speak, ladies. That's what, that's what I observed in my formative years. And so in seeing that example, that's what I thought that it meant to be a man. And so I, I, I you know, like father, like son, the, the cliche says. Um, and so I wanted to, to imitate that, but that was a horrible example. But I followed through on it and I imitated the, them until I got that divine two by four that knocked some sense into me, but you yeah. know, yeah. the father. Well, old. so let's talk, let's talk about your book and um, the timing of your book and you're, you're frozen at the moment. I don't think I'm frozen. Am I? Yeah. You're frozen to me. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. We're back. I think oh, we're yeah. back. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the timing of your book. It, yeah. We've hinted a bit at the time, and and but I think you froze again, Dan. I can't. I can't hear you. You froze, and everybody in their little images froze. I don't know if anybody can hear me. Yep, they can. Somebody's waving. Good. Okay, nodding ahead. <laughs> but I can't hear a thing. My buddy Giuseppe says I didn't freeze, but I can't hear Dan at all. Huh. Well, I'll just keep talking. I don't know. Maybe Dan will come back on. Um, so you guys, somebody wave if you can hear me. Okay, everybody that I can see just wave. Fantastic. All right, so I'm just going to pick up where Dan left off, I guess. He'll, he'll jump back on. So the timing of the book, he was asking. Yeah, the timing, I, I did not anticipate that things were going to go the route that they have in the world with, um, you know, the whole stuff that came about with the coronavirus and all that stuff, nor did I anticipate the civil unrest, I don't think anybody did, that we're experiencing now, that's gone to kind of almost complete chaos in the streets now with all the stuff that we're seeing. Um, but again, even though that wasn't the intention when I put the book together, because I didn't know it was going to happen, the intention was to help heal families and to bring about a renewal in families, society, and the priesthood, uh, and all of that. But I think this, I think St. Joseph also is the answer to all of the unrest that's happening in the world, the sense of revolution that's in the air, because it certainly is. As I go to prayer and I watch TV, I'm seeing this and I'm thinking to myself, my, my, what is going on here? Um, we need a, a gift from God. We need a movement from God to get us back. And, and, you know, I talk about in the book, that there have been prophecies that have spoken about a forthcoming time in the church that would be very, very difficult, very, where people would struggle greatly. And some of these prophecies date back to the 16th century, but they, they're even more recent ones. 19th century Spain, a particular saint has talked about that, how, you know, we really need um, St. Joseph to help us uh, in this time. And especially right now, because at the root of all of this, as Sister Lucia dos Santos said, you know, the, the longest lived visionary of Fatima, she said that the final battle between good and evil would be over marriage and the family. And we're seeing that play out because there's so many things that go with that. 
for example, contraception, abortion, so-called homosexual marriage, um, so many things, the gender confusion that we're seeing today. These are marriage and family issues. We've, we've had whole societies and cultures now redefine marriage. Well, how do we get out of this mess? How, how do we, you know, recover lost ground and go back to common sense and reason when it comes to these things? Now, we've all, I mean, most of you, I, I, I would assume, watching this, you're, 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 you're Catholic. You love Jesus Christ. You've been baptized. Great. Most of you probably have given your, Dan, you're back, but I was just picking up where you left off, buddy. So no, I, I, I keep going. I was, okay. All right. All right. This is so, where I wanted to go. So yeah. So yeah. So many of you probably have done a Marian consecration, which is fantastic. One of the best things that you can do for your spiritual life without a doubt. But see in a time of crisis with families, we need to close the gap and bring in the father. And that's why I think that the Holy Spirit is now telling us as, as a people, as a church, that now is the time of St. Joseph. And this is why I think this treasure hasn't been fully revealed until now. It's definitely part of divine revelation, but we haven't really been able to unpack it um, until recent. And so this has only been happening for like the last 150 years. And I could go through the litany, which I'll spare you the time, but in the book, at the beginning, in the introduction, I do a chronological list of what's been building, snowballing, gaining momentum, and it's crescendoing right now with St. Joseph. I mean it, big time. So in 1870 is when it began, and that's 150 years ago, by the way. We're in the anniversary year right now. So that's when Blessed Pope Pius IX declared St. Joseph the patron of the universal church. That's, that's huge. And then right after that, we get St. Joseph appeared in an apparition, which is almost unheard of. He appeared at Knock, Ireland. Classic form, he didn't say anything. You know, nobody did at Knock, the Knock apparition. <laughs> but, um, so they were imitating St. Joseph in that apparition, I guess you could say. Um, so then after that, we get the first encyclical on St. Joseph. It's hard to believe that it took until 1889 to get an encyclical on St. Joseph. And that was Pope Leo XIII who did that. And then right after that, we um, get the Fatima apparitions where St. Joseph was present uh, on a very neglected aspect of the Fatima apparitions, I think. Uh, and then we get the Litany of St. Joseph approved. We get um, St. Joseph's name in the Holy Mass. I mean, this is almost embarrassing, especially as a priest to say, it took 1,962 years for Joseph's name to go into the holiest of all prayers, the Holy Mass. 1,962 years. So is, is St. Joseph the mirror of patience? Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, wow. So now his name is in all the Eucharistic prayers, and we have a new feast for him in 1955, St. Joseph the Worker, to help combat communism. And we're seeing this stuff now. Seven dioceses in the United States, as a fruit of this, have declared a year of St. Joseph. Bishop Ricken is one of them, but there are six others. And it continues to, something is happening. The Holy Spirit is saying, pay attention to Joseph. Pay attention to Joseph. We've had some of the greatest saints to promote him in our times. You know, St. Andre Bessette, Dan, whom you mentioned at the beginning of Montreal. And um, so something is up, guys. And that's one of the main reasons why I put this together was to close the circle in a time of crisis of families and marriages and bring in, you know, the, the man to the situation who's been so neglected, so undervalued, and not paid enough attention to, because we've never needed a more to help us uh, during these difficult times. You know, you couldn't have said it better. And it, it, it's for every difficult time and every difficulty we face in the church, the Lord raises up saints. And uh, he both reproposes, if you will, or re-promotes re or, or lifts up uh, some from the past or brings up uh, new saints in the present. And I think you're right. I was struck by Pope Francis's move to bring uh, uh, St. Joseph forward. But before my own encounter with St. Joseph and my own healing, I was also struck by the uh, devotion that St. Teresa of Avila yep. had to, of course, my, uh, she's my confirmation saint, and, and I really think brought me into the church. I was actually confirmed and received, not by my own doing, on the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, which is wow. 
kind of thrusting me into Carmelite spirituality. But I'd like to read a, a, a few quotes from St. Teresa about St. Joseph that I think you're, you're bringing out in your book. She said in one quote, I took from my patron and Lord, the glorious St. Joseph. I cannot call to mind that I've ever asked him at any time for anything he has not granted. I am filled with amazement when I consider the great favors God has given to me through this blessed saint. And of course, if you know the history there, she named her first uh, convent after she left the Incarnacion uh, just outside of um, Avila and left the ancient Carmelites to start the Reform Carmelites and her first I'll give one more quote and you can you can comment to other saints and this is from her life to other saints our Lord seems to have given power to succor us in some special necessity but to this glorious saint I know by experience he has given the power to help us in all our Lord would have us to understand that he as he was subject to St. Joseph on the earth. So Jesus was subject to St. Joseph on the earth. Yeah. For St. Joseph, bearing the title of father and being his guardian, could command him. So now in heaven, our Lord grants all his petitions. I have asked others to recommend themselves to St. Joseph, and they too know the same thing by experience. Mm. So tell us tell us a bit about, and, and, and I went out, so I, I, I think what I missed was your why now which is so important but tell us a bit about uh the framework that you used to build this consecration to saint joseph and then where you got your inspirations for each of the uh reflections on him yeah yeah no great question dan and you know just piggybacking on what you said about saint Teresa of avila it is fascinating isn't it that her favorite saint saint joseph was the one that she relied upon when she brought about a great reform. And I, I think, again, the Holy Spirit is telling us, just like St. Teresa of Avila did, you know, in the 16th century, we also are in great need of reform today on many levels. So we need to go to Joseph, you know, in a, in a big way. It, it works. It really works. So, yeah. So the, the book itself, you know, when I was thinking about a, a method for it, I had a certain idea, and I spent about three months working on it. And then in prayer, I just got so frustrated, and I said to the Lord, you know what, my idea is not working. This book is not going to make sense. And I threw away basically everything that I had written down, three months. And so I, I prayed, what do you want me to do, God? How do you want me to organize this thing? So I, it just dawned upon me, a Holy Spirit moment, you know, why am I trying to reinvent the wheel? St. Louis de Montfort already totally nailed the method for Marian consecration, 33 days, you do readings and prayers, uh, just base it on that. And so I was like, duh, you know, that's, that's brilliant. Why am I, you know, pulling my hair out here, trying, trying to come up with my own thing. But then I did have a dilemma because, you know, St. Louis de Montfort bases his off of, you know, the, the doctrines. And at that time, what were the two, um, the, uh, the dogmas that uh, he, he knew about, with Our Lady, because the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption Dogma came after St. Louis de Montfort's death, uh, but they were, you know, doctrinally understood. So I didn't have that with St. Joseph. You know, the Church doesn't have, like, doctrinal formulations for St. Joseph like we do for Our Lady. So I thought to myself, okay, I know the method, but what's the meat of the book? Like, how, what do I base it off of? So I said, all right, you know what, let me, let me pray about it. And I was praying the litany of St. Joseph every day, asking for inspiration. Well, one day I, I looked at it and I thought, hold on a minute. And I said, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I counted up the titles in the litany and I said, there it is, the template for the book. This is what the church actually teaches about St. Joseph, these titles. Let's use the litany, unpack them, and then put other stuff on it, like what saints have said, popes have said shrines about St. Joseph, what mystics have said, what um, religious communities have been founded to, to honor St. Joseph, all that. And it just worked out brilliant. And so, yeah, it's a 33-day program that you can do by yourself or as a couple, as a, as a family, as a parish. And everything that you need for it is in one book. There's no separate manuals or anything. It's all in here. The group, even the group format is in the book in the back. Um, yeah, and it's, it's only been out 
for a little over five months and we've sold over 130,000 copies. Wow. Um, That's awesome. It's un- yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. I'm like, Holy moly. How are people even finding out? I get people contacting me from South Africa and New Zealand and Singapore. And I'm like, wow, it's praise God. I mean, it's, it's catching on. That's great. So uh, I want to tell folks, we are going to be taking questions in a minute. So if you want to, uh, I'll have Allie turn the chat back on and you can start typing your questions. But Father, I'd like you to speak as a father, as a, you know, from the heart of a pastor uh, to a couple of things. One, those who've had wounds inflicted by their fathers, whether they're maybe the, the lesser, their weak fathers, maybe the worse, their abusive fathers. Um, what can they, how can they, uh, embark on this consecration and engage with St. Joseph that can bring healing, maybe uh, remedy some of their perception of God the Father through distorted lens of the one who was supposed to, in essence, represent God the Father to them. How can, how can they engage in this uh, beautiful consecration to bring healing uh, to their own hearts and then maybe broader intentions about um, society. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, I think his, in his titles, um, we find who he is. So some of those titles for us are so endearing. They're so um, affectionate. They're so tender for a man of such great strength. Remember, he's also the terror of demons that's one of his titles. It's my particular favorite as a guy, right? I gravitate towards that. Oh, that's, that's my dad. You know, don't mess with my dad. But at the same time, a man who has such authority, who can hold God in his hands, and also with such strength, is also very tender. He uses that authority in the right way. He is never going to hurt you or harm you. He's available 24-7. He's a comforting father. So in that litany of St. Joseph, for example, one of his titles is Comfort of the Afflicted. Now, it is so comforting to know that you have a father who is always there for you at any time, any moment of your life to share that with you, to be present for you. I mean, that, you know, is extraordinary gift for us to know. Uh, another one of his titles is the Solace of the Miserable. I mean, I, I know a lot of miserable people today. I really do. And a lot of it isn't of their own choosing. They've been hurt. They've been harmed. I know a lot of people today who are out of work and they're worried. They're anxious. They're fearful about the future because of the, the world situation. Well, he's, he's that comfort. He's that solace in a, in a miserable situation. So no matter what you know, our experience has been, and oftentimes it, it can be very strong, we've got St. Joseph. We've got the man that when God the Father was looking for a man, to, to entrust the care of his son to, he looked to St. Joseph and he said, that's the one. That's the one that's going to be there for my son to model me. This is God the Father saying this, you know, to model me, my fatherhood, for my eternal son. I mean, awesome. what a blessing to have. I mean, we, you couldn't get a better dad. You couldn't get a better one. And so, you know, when I discovered this myself years ago, I mean, I just, I said, St. Joseph, Help me because I've, I've got a lot of, you know, things that I've been hurt, hurt by in my fathers and I need healing myself. You know, I'm not perfect. This is a, a, a process, a lifelong process. Help me not to live uh, imitating some of those bad things that were given to me, that were shown to me, things that I should not have seen as a young boy that really warped me and I'm still healing from. You know, I have my big conversion, but I'm still healing from many of these things. And when I run to Joseph, when I go to Joseph, it really does help me. It, it keeps me from going down the path of, of vice to striving to acquire virtue. And St. Joseph's name, by the way, I love this. I love this. I didn't know this until I did my research. The name Joseph means increase. Hmm. Your spiritual father is the increaser. He's going to increase the presence of Jesus in your life. He's going to increase the presence of Our Lady in your life. He's going to impre- increase the, 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 the grace and, and virtue in your life. And I, that's how we're going to grow. That's how we're going to, you know, heal. And that's how we're going to grow in holiness. You know, I, I 
by God's grace, my kids are, um, are, are doing well. You know, there's still uh, one who's trying to figure things out. But now I uh, head up a community of, of several thousand uh, participants from around the world, Apostoli VA, and I regularly kneel before the statue of St. Joseph at the Cathedral of St. Paul in, in Birmingham, which is, there's a beautiful statue. And I ask him to be a father to me and to be and to help me to be a better father. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if wherever your wounds are, you know, if your father was weak or abusive, yeah. you know, just pray and, and in prayer, use these beautiful images that uh, Father Calloway is, has commissioned, you know, or, the, or that's on the front of his book and just ask him, you know, be a father to me and help me to know what a true father is and help me to know God the Father and the goodness through you. So Father Calloway, uh, we have a lot of questions. And so what I'd like to do is read them to you. And, and there's, uh, of course, they need to get the book uh, and order Consecration to St. Joseph, uh, The Wonders of Our Spiritual Father by Father Donald Calloway. Uh, and that'll answer a lot of questions. But uh, if we could uh, do some uh, quicker answers, just to make sure. sure we get through all the questions. Yep. And uh, not that you've been too long, you've been perfect so far, but I wanna make sure we answer as many of these questions as we can. So Gina asks, can you do the consecration more than once in a year? Oh, sure, yeah, absolutely. There's a chart in the book that shows you some options. Feel free. Um, and by the way, there's a great website that's set up that gives you a lot of this. If you want to check it out, it's consecration to St. Joseph.org. Um, is it spelled out saint or is it S T Joseph? Yeah, it's just S T. Don't spell out saint. Thank, thank you, Dan, for that. So it's consecration to St. Joseph.org. Okay. And I'm going to, uh, I just put it in there. I hope, uh, I think that, I think I got it right, but, uh, okay. so in that list, well, of course the book lists the dates that they can use. Yeah, those are options. You can do your own dates as well. Yeah. In our community, we pray to St. Joseph in several ways. St. Joseph, Father of the Church, when we're praying for the Pope, bishops, cardinals, leaders, deacons, all of that, religious. Yeah. And we pray for you every day, by the way, uh, in, that, in that prayer. Wow. Th then we also pray St. Joseph as part of a prayer, and he comes under the title of Terror of Dem Demons. So Angela asks, can you talk about St. Joseph as the terror of demons and how that can be relevant moniker in relation to him for this particular time? Oh, yes. So nobody seems to know the exact origin of when that title popped into existence in the church. However, most um, what we call Josephologists, people who study St. Joseph, um, say that there's two reasons we call him that. One, the first one, is because he saved Jesus from Herod. So remember, Herod was out to kill him. Well, this is huge, by the way, for the pro-life movement today. St. Joseph is the missing piece also for the pro-life movement because he's got this unique title. He's called Savior of the Savior. Now, not because he's God or the Messiah or divine. He's not. We know that. But he saved Jesus from Herod. So we need to call upon St. Joseph today to help us to save babies. So very, very pertinent and relevant for today. The second is because he, after Our Lady, is the greatest intercessor before the throne of God for us uh, because he can call God, the second person of the Trinity, his son. Only Mary can do that. You and I can't do that. You and I cannot pray to Jesus and say, my Jesus, Lord, Savior, and Son. That wouldn't be right. You know, we, we need some spiritual direction on that one, right? But no, but Joseph can. So the power of him, and the devil hates that St. Joseph can save babies. So the devil's terrified of that. And he's terrified of the intercessory power of St. Joseph. So that's why he's the terror of demons. You know, I also, I'm, I have a theory, Father, I'm, I'm suspicious about this in a good way, and that I'm involved with a number of exorcisms and exorcists. And sometimes in an exorcism, a particular saint will show up and rattle the cage of the demons, and sometimes the person is completely liberated. I suspect there's been a moment at some point in history where an exorcist, where he showed up and the demons fled and uh, 
and then the story spread about it. But uh, yep. your your answer is is good as well. I, we'll find out in heaven where that title exactly came from. But uh, I have a question from Therese. She says, "Should we pray the litany to Saint Joseph daily for our families, country, and world?" I have done the consecration, and it is awesome. Mm. Yes, absolutely pray that prayer. It's the officially approved prayer to St. Joseph of the Church, approved in 1909 by Blessed or St. Pope Pius X. I pray it daily myself. Um, it's, it's one of the most powerful prayers, I think, that we have to St. Joseph. So by all means, keep doing it. Wonderful. Wilma asks, I've just finished consecrating my six children to our Blessed Mother, using St. Louis de Montfort, can I, as a mother, consecrate my sons to St. Joseph using their book, your book? They're all adults and fathers now. Yes, you can, because you have that spiritual authority in that relationship to be able to do that. Um, a lot of people ask me similar questions like, Father, can I consecrate my boss? I'm like, well, it's a little different. You can pray for him, but you don't really have authority in that relationship. So well-intentioned, but yes, for your children, yes. Nancy asks, can doing the consecration to St. Joseph help uh, divorced families? Oh, without a doubt. Sure, of course. Um, I find a lot of people coming to me today saying um, that they're doing it for that particular intention. And St. Joseph is bringing great comfort and healing in that situation. We're all sinners. We're all broken, wounded, and we need a good father. Elizabeth said, I remember reading about Mary and Jesus being connected in your book, but cannot find it now. It was a blessed book and was fruitful in my healing. I'm not clear where she's going, but uh, do you have any thoughts about that? She might be thinking, I have a book called Under the Mantle, and I talk about um, something called fetal microchimerism. It's a very uh -huh. technical thing. But oh, it's yes. Very, yeah, the cells of a mother and child exchange. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't happen with the father. Uh, at least science has not shown that yet. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, that, that doesn't seem to be a connection there. But nonetheless, you're connected by that affective, intimate relationship uh, with your father. So, Beth Marcello made sure we had your, your URL. Is it Father Calloway, C-A-L-L-O-W-A-Y.com? Yeah, that's another website. It doesn't have all the stuff for the consecration, though. Um, if you want to find out the other books or the pilgrimages, you would use that one. Okay, great. But they can find links no matter what. That might be the easier one to remember. And it's Father, F-A-T-H-E-R, spelled out, right? Yeah, FatherCalloway.com. Great. Christina, is it possible to consecrate a loved one to St. Joseph who has the father wound but who might not be open to going through the book herself? Right. Yeah, that's a little tricky. I mean, you can do something like a, a pious entrustment, you could say, but the person on that level, if they're not under your authority per se, they do their own will needs to be involved. They need to participate themselves on some level, but certainly pray for them and ask Our Lady St. Joseph to, to, to come into their life and, and to help them to uh, experience that deeper conversion. Oh, this one's close to my heart. I have an autistic child. Uh, Don says, can I do the consecration on behalf of my 13-year-old son um, who is nonverbal autistic? Would that be a lack of a better word or valid? He has so many struggles, and I pray to St. Joseph for him often. Yeah. Oh, no, of course. And, and you're not even really doing it on behalf of them. You know, you, you're, you're the parent, so you're doing it, you know, for their good, just like you, uh, you know, for their good, when they're little babies, you have them baptized, right? Yeah. So, of course, entrust them, consecrate them to Our, to our Lady and to St. Joseph. Absolutely. Uh, Tommy asks, and this goes to my suspicion uh, about terror of demons. He says, hello, Father. After each Fatima prayer, after each mystery of the rosary, I add, St. Joseph, pray for us. I've been told by an exorcist that this is very powerful in combating Satan. What is your opinion on that? Oh, yeah, that's no problem. I mean... Um, you definitely want to be like, I wouldn't like start doing that. Like if you have a prayer group in your parish after mass, just keep it to the rosary that we know instead of adding stuff in a public forum, unless the group is comfortable with it and approves it. Cause sometimes I know people, they want to keep adding, 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 adding things. And it gets, you know, really long, but you're right. St. Joseph is very powerful. And actually last year, I think it was, uh, oh, what's his name? He's one of these bloggers. He brought up a book that there was an exorcism, I think in the fifties, 
uh, where it was a girl and um, Satan was talking about how much uh, Saint jo- how much power Saint Joseph has and how the devil is terrified uh, of him. So like you were saying, Dan, this actually has been manifested in exorcism, the devil himself testifying to the power of Saint Joseph. Yeah, that was the young woman, I think she was in Croatia, mm. and the movie Exorcism of Emily Rose, I think, was made about her. Yeah, that's it, right. Yeah, and I think it was Taylor Marshall. And uh, Yeah, it was uh, Taylor Marshall. Was talking about that on one of his shows. Mm-hmm. Um, Luis uh, asks, or Luis asks, with all the Marian apparitions and so many, so much attention from JP2, that Mary will usher in the age of peace after the tribulation. Does this, and meaning this, the consecration to St. Joseph, detract mm. from what she's been asking of us? And, and he says that and he's, he's been pulled out many different ways. Sounds like he needs a spiritual director to help him kind of get sure. narrowed in. But, you know, he wants to add this to everything else I'm doing. And, and he's doing, uh, you know, uh, rosary, divine mercy chaplet, mass, fasting, chaplet of oppressive blood. Sure. You know, I think maybe a little direction from you might be helpful. Yeah. And, you know, it's a good question. I, I look at it from this perspective. You're not a child of a one parent spiritual family. So remember, Jesus entrusted himself into the care of Mary and Joseph. And so we want to imitate Jesus. So it's not a competition for sure. The, it's best that all children, and we're children of God, uh, have a mom and a dad. That's the best scenario. And that's what Jesus had. That's what we have an opportunity to have. And so let's, let's do it. Let's, um, you know, have this complementarity. Because in a family, you never just run to one parent. You need both. And so now the Holy Spirit is revealing this in these difficult and crazy times. And so we, we need to do that. And so it's, it's, uh, it's very complimentary. And I think it's very pleasing to Jesus and to Our Lady that we bring St. Joseph into this. And remember, at Fatima, St. Joseph appeared. And he was holding the Christ child, and he blessed the world with the child Jesus simultaneously. So remember, Fatima is a family apparition. <laughs> so the triumph of the Immaculate Heart is going to mean also the triumph of the Sacred Heart and the chaste heart of her husband, Joseph. Her heart's not going to rejoice when families are in chaos. So let's bring in dad. Let's bring in St. Joseph, right? Fantastic. I, uh, one, uh, one person asked, is the book going to be available in Spanish? Yes. Um, it's being translated. It's almost done right now. But then we've got to get a second eye on it to make sure everything's theologically correct. Uh, it'll be available probably the first week of September in Spanish. Great. Now, last question, because I, I don't want to... Uh, no, given us, and I really appreciate that. Um, and, and I have an opinion, so I'll state it. What do you think about s- sleeping, St. Joseph? I've had sleep troubles my whole life, not because of anxiety, but physiological. And I've and my wife got me a statue of sleeping St. Joseph, put it near my bed at home. Now I'm obviously on the road. I need to bring it with me on the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I touch it often and ask for his blessing for sleep. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on it? I, I, I think it's, it's helped me, but yeah, so it's a very popular devotion now where you get the statue of St. Joseph where he's asleep. Because remember, he talked to God even when he slept. You know, God communicated to him. And so what you normally do is you place your intention in a little piece of paper under the statue uh, so that St. Joseph can sleep on it, meaning talking to God, you know, about your particular intention. I, I do this. I've got, I've got a stack. My statue is about this far off the ground now because I've got so many intentions under it, you know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think it's fantastic. And uh, I, two, two women so far have told me that after doing the consecration, they no longer suffer from uh, insomnia. They sleep now like a baby. Awesome. Awesome. I, I'm not that good, but I, things have <laughs> definitely improved markedly. So the book, of course, is Consecration to St. Joseph, The Wonders of Our Spiritual Father by Donald Galloway. And for those who have been live streaming this and caught this, if you caught it late, we're going to post this out at spiritualdirection.com so you can catch uh, the, con- the early conversation when I disappeared as well, uh, which was maybe the best part of the whole conversation, and then uh, get all of the links and things. But you can find um, Father, tell them, fathercalloway.com, Father is spelled out F-A-T-H-E-R, 
C-A-L-L-O-W-A-Y.com. And then where else can they find information? Yeah, uh, so if you want to get the book, you can also get it. We have the e-version, like the Kindle and stuff. I don't even have one of those, but a lot of people do. So you can get it that way. And the artwork. Remember, we've got all this artwork, many images that are just phenomenal images of St. Joseph. You can buy those. They're only $19 on the, the website. So it's consecration to St. Joseph.org. Don't spell out the saint, just ST, consecration to St. Joseph.org. Check it out. Whether you buy something or not, check it out because you're going to be impressed. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty cool looking website. Yeah, and Ali, our, our moderator, has uh, put the hot link there to that. You can find that at the 647 mark in the, in the chat. But as I said, we'll, we'll have the whole show for you out at uh, spiritualdirection.com. We'll also send it out to uh, the, the folks who registered. And what I'd like to do as we close out today is uh, also to possiblyva.org where we are doing formation on spiritual combat. So St. Joseph is the terror of demons. We're studying uh, spiritual combat this Saturday morning. We meet free. It's a no-cost formation, and we'll be uh, starting at 8 a.m. Central Time and reviewing that book and, and digging into that. Make sure you check out all that Father Calloway has to offer. Um, he's doing a great work for the church and helping us turn our hearts to the Father, which is a, also a prophecy, I think, uh, out of uh, the Old Testament regarding the latter times. So, Father, can you close us in prayer? Pray for us. Pray for, uh, you know, there's people from around the world here. I think yeah. you and I both uh, probably have a heavy heart for the chaos that's rising in the United States and for authentic fatherhood um, to really heal the divisions that, that we have here uh, among us. Uh, if you could close us in prayer and give us your blessing, I'd be grateful. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you in these difficult days in which we are living, where there is so much confusion, where there is so much unrest. We pray for renewal in our hearts, in our families, in our nations, in our church. Send down your Holy Spirit, for the powerful intercession of Our Lady, the spouse of the Spirit, and the great Saint Joseph, our spiritual father. Help us and the areas that we need to grow, to turn away from sin and turn to lives of virtue, to turn away from darkness and turn to the light. We pray for great conversions through the intercession of St. Joseph, especially for our loved ones who are away from the faith, that they would come back to the practice of the sacraments. And Heavenly Father, as your priest, I bestow a blessing on, upon everyone who's viewing and listening to this program for their particular intentions the blessing of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and to uh, thank you for uh, writing this book for this time and uh, for all the good work that you do. And I know that many who are watching are grateful to you and as am I, and that uh, they they'll, they'll, will all also be praying for you because awesome. we need, I, I tell everyone, we're living in tough times. Every faithful priest you know, you should be pouring out your heart every day before God to support them. Every faithful bishop that you're aware of, um, everyone who's in leadership in the church that are faithful to the magisterium, that are strong, we need to pray every day because it is a time of much confusion yeah. and uh, men like uh, Father Calloway are helping to clear the air and, and uh, light the way and to really help us to focus and to face the storm that we're facing in so many ways and to, in Jesus' name, and by his power, by his true and holy church, the Catholic Church, uh, will overcome and we will survive the storm through the sacraments, through the church, through the grace of Jesus uh, through the blessing of his saints like St. Saint Joseph in particular and the Blessed Mother. So thank you uh, for all you do, Father, and for all of you who joined us tonight. Uh, please be holy 
and please be a light to the world. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, God bless.